What's up guys? Welcome to another epic webinar with Sony Alpha South Africa. I really feel privileged to be able to be here today with you guys and to share a bit of knowledge on time-lapse photography. Now, time-lapse photography is sort of stuck between photography and videography and it's sort of a happy medium in between which really excites me. So we're going to be talking about how to take time lapse, what it is, where it fits in in the world, settings, and all of these different parts that go together with it. Now, if you have any questions, this will be an interactive thing. If you look below the video feed, you will see that there's a question and answer box. Please take your time, put in a question. I'm happy to answer them. I will look through those questions as we move along and we'll make and I will happily answer those. But to start with, let's go into what is time lapse photography. So time lapse photography, as I said, is this medium between photography and videography. And it is the ability to take a large amount of time and squeeze it into a very small amount of time. And this is a very important part of what time-lapse photography it is. It, it, it makes it possible to see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see with the naked eye. This is a beautiful time-lapse that I took in a place called Gondwana down in Mossel Bay. And you get the idea of the clouds moving, of how the landscape's going. You can see the trees moving in the wind. So you get this large amount of time that was two hours squeezed into about 20 seconds. Another cool time lapse of a beautiful crater lake in Uganda. It's one of the places that we visit, um, which is called Ndali Lodge. And they are on these old volcanic craters that have, um, that have filled up with water. And then obviously our iconic table mountain with its blanket coming over. As soon as you speed things up, you can even see the kite surfers going because I was in Bloberg at that stage moving around. Um, and it really gives you the sense of how things move. So when we're looking at that in the first place, it's very difficult to capture that information with our time lapse. So what we're doing is we're effectively incrementally taking photos at a larger rate than what a video camera would do. So there are three ways we could shoot this. One, we could shoot it with a video camera or with a video function on our camera. And we could push record and say, record. Now, our video, our cameras here have a 30 minute cutoff where they'll stop recording after 30 minutes for heat purposes. So you've got to be careful because then you'll have to hit the button again and make sure that you're rolling with that. And then what you would do in post-production in something like Premiere Pro or a video editing suite of some sorts is you would then speed it up, say 2000 times, so that you're now moving everything along faster so that you got, or 2000%, so that you got things moving faster, like in that there. So you can imagine you could video that and just speed it up and move along. But what it lacks is one video, you have to have a very expensive um, video camera to be able to shoot in RAW. So your editing and your color grading is very, it's much more limited than shooting a photograph. Secondly, we can slow shutter speeds, which changes the perspective of what's going on. Um, and we also have far more editing capability within a still photo to be able to push and pull to add a bit of oomph and make it really gutsy. So these are the, the few things that we're, we're looking at. Um, again, guys, it, just a, a reminder that if there are any questions, please, you can fill in below. There's a question bar at the bottom here. You're more than welcome to do that and we will interact. I would love to chat and get a feel of what stuff you would like to learn today. So like I was saying, how we shoot time lapse. So one, we could use video. Two, we could then use our in-camera S and Q settings. So on the top of my camera here, just up top here, there's a function called S and Q, S and Q. And this S and Q function is 
awesome. It allows us to do two things. It can it allows us to shoot in slow motion. So if we have a high moving subject, it's a video that it's taking and it can shoot anything up to 100 frames a second. And we'll go into this a little bit later. Um, and we can go slowly to one frame every second. So it's a great way if we go down to one frame a second or two frames a second of creating a time lapse. It is limited though that the slowest rate is one frame a second. With an intervalometer, we can go much longer. We can go to 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one shot a day, etc. But then we're talking very long time lapse distances. And it's a really cool way of doing it because once you start that video, it will take those one photo every second as it goes along, click, 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 as it goes along. And at the end of it, when you stop it, it will create the time lapse for you. So it's a really effective way of doing a time lapse because one, it means no editing. And you will see when we get down to the editing part of this, the editing is quite a, it's a deal. You, you're, you've got to be committed to what you're doing to, to sit through the process because it can take a, a, a few, an hour or two to, to really edit a, a time lapse properly. The third way, and obviously my favorite way, is individual photos. Now, like I was saying, it takes a lot longer. It is definitely a labor of love, but you can really pull it out. You can work on your shadows and your highlights. You can create more punch and add more clarity and sharpening and work on different areas of the image as in what you please in order to create these incredible time lapses and well edited time lapses over the period of time that you're shooting. And um, so it takes a bit longer. You have no immediate gratification like the SNQ settings and we would just have to move on from there. So what do we need? Right, obviously we need a camera and a lens. Just the camera is not gonna help so much. All right, so we need a camera. Um, my first choice of camera is the A7R 3 uh, or the A7R 4 The reason being is that it really makes a big difference to have a lot of megapixels. And it sounds weird, but when we're shooting something like S and Q, you are setting the video up at 1080p or 4K, however you're setting it up. And when it records it, you are stuck at that. When I'm shooting at 42 megapixels, we're at 8K effectively, 6K, 8K, 8K. And it allows a lot more space and post-production movement. So what I will do is there's a lot of things you can use. You buy these expensive sliders, they're like 20,000 Rand for a slider. And you put the camera on, and I've used one or two in, in shoots uh, for people, but you put it on the thing, on the slider, and as you're taking the images, it will slowly move across at the pace, so you get the sense of movement going through. Now, as much as it doesn't replace the sense of movement, being able to go and have a bigger, say a 4K video, and work it down to 1080p and create a gradual slide, which I'll show you at the end of this when we're doing the editing, you will get a great effect from it. The next thing we absolutely, positively need is a tripod. You don't want to be putting stuff on a bean bag that could get bumped or move or anything because as soon as something starts moving in your time lapse, if a camera moves, the whole time lapse moves. So you're looking at one perspective and then suddenly you're looking at another and it messes the whole thing up. So a tripod is very important. My heavy duty one, I actually have the camera on right now. And then this is my travel tripod. So it's a little Manfrotto tripod. And this thing is amazing. It is awesome. It is incredibly light. It's less than a kilo. So it means that I can travel well with it. And it's really sturdy. It's made out of carbon fiber, which is, which is really boss. Um, the, the more sturdy one, the bigger one that the camera's on right now is preferential. The sturdier your point of rest, 
the better your time lapse is going to turn out. With something like this, as soon as I extend the legs out, these legs, because it's light, still have some play in them and there could be some movement if there's wind or anything like that. The next thing we have to understand on the tripod is at the bottom here, just down here, there's a little hook over here. So if I pull this hook out, and now he's going to give me nonsense. There's the hook down here. So you can see the hook over there. What I can do is I always carry a carabiner around with me. I could hook the carabiner over this and then hook a beanbag on. Yes, come on. Carabiner, work with me. Carabiner on there. And then I could hook, say, a beanbag onto the bottom or I could hang a beanbag from the bottom. And what this will do is it will weight down the tripod. It'll keep it from swaying. If I don't have a, a bean bag with me, I often put my bag on it. So I'll actually hang my camera bag because my camera bag weighs too much anyway. So I'll hang it down, which will give me a extra bit of stability to keep this as still as possible. And that really helps bring out the time lapse because by it not moving, or if you have a slider or these little gimmicks that you can get on the top that rotate your camera around, these will all fit on the tripod but that movement is constant and it's static. So it makes you, it gives a really different feel to the whole thing. So a tripod is a must have thing. And the one thing I really wanna point out about the tripod is please don't go out and buy a cheap tripod. <coughs> it is not going to assist you in the long run. In a month or two months, you will have to buy a new one. It is an investment for, for life. Um, I use tripods heavily, heavily. And when I was using tripods, especially when I was doing architectural photography, I spent good money, but not too much money on a tripod. Within a couple of months, the things started falling apart. They just didn't like being opened and closed and used all that much. So just go out, save up, buy a good tripod. It's going to save you a, a long way. All right, so... We've spoken about the camera, now let's talk about lenses. So my favorite lens for time lapse is my 16 to 35. This guy is an absolute, absolute beast. Um, nice and wide, gives us a lot of perspective. When we're shooting time lapse, we want to choose shoot things that are moving. So often it's clouds, it's water, it's things that are that you can't really comprehend the motion without speeding it up. So that is a very important thing. Shadows are a good thing to do time lapses of. So going wide allows us to get space, big skies, and capture those bigger things that are moving. Stars are a great one, and we'll show you, show you some, some star time lapses as we go along. So 1635 is a good one. The 24 to 70 that I'm recording myself with now, also epic lens. Brilliant to be able to go landscape, to zoom in on things, and capture that motion. And both of these lenses are 2.8, but there are F4 versions of these. And when we're talking about time-lapse, your, your speed of your lens doesn't really come into play too much because it's landscape photography. You're wanting more depth of field. You, only if you're doing stars or day-to-night stuff do you need a faster lens, a bigger aperture to be able to work through that. So choose your lens according to what you have. What I'm overly excited about is two days ago, Sony released the announcement that they are bringing out a 12 to 24 mil, 2.8. I am, I can't wait. I just cannot wait to get my hands on the thing. It very possibly could replace this 1635 I am very excited to see what it's going to do, especially for Astro and for time lapse like this. So that's a, a big part of the whole thing. The next thing we can, there's an outside sales, is a intervalometer. And the intervalometers are really important in being able to time your shots. All right. Be, uh, when I first changed over to Sony, both my cameras didn't have an intervalometer built in. 
What is amazing about and what blew me away about, uh, about the Sony stuff was things that you would normally have to wait for the next model of camera to come out in order to get. These guys just sent out and Sony said, here's your free firmware update. It includes a intervalometer on it. So this was a massive jump. So before that, what I needed was one of these and this I can then program to say I want 15 seconds per shot and how many shots I would like. I will show you shortly how we work the internal intervalometer on the camera. So I will actually show you a video as I move through that. Having this is a benefit because this is also a great shutter, shutter lock button for stars. So we can lock open our shutter and we can also do uh, it's also remote so I can plug this into the top of the camera the receiver and the Harnell goes on top there and then this talks so I don't even have to touch the camera so there's no movement involved and um, it works really well they also have lightning connectors that connect to these so if there's lightning you pick up that motion connectors so there's many different things that work with these systems but they can get quite costly and it's quite nice that we have it built into our cameras. So an intervalometer is a very important thing to do because you're not going to want to sit there and go, okay, that's a minute, push the button. Uh, that's a minute, push the button. Because if you're doing a two or three hour time lapse, you are going to be very tired by the end of it. The next things we're going to look at <clears throat> is an ND filter. So this is an ND filter here. Uh, no, that's the polarizer, sorry. That's an ND filter here. And what an ND filter does effectively is it blocks light. This is an ND64. So you can see there that it is a six stop, um, six stop block of light. So it blocks light six times or yeah, it halves the light six times. So you can see through there, you can't see me, but you can see how it completely blocks the light. So what this will do is this is epic because our time and the way we shoot, the way we shoot time lapses is that we want to show a slower shutter speed. You do not want a crisp clear image each time. If I wave my hand like this, you can see a blur and that looks normal to you. We don't perceive life at two thousandth of a second. Something like a fly does. A fly, the reason why we can't catch it is because it looks at life in like, I think it's something like 2,000 frames a second. We are looking at life in a slower point so we see blur. So if, a, if you shoot a video at too fast a shutter speed, what you end up with is something that looks a little too rigid and bounces a lot and your brain doesn't like that thought. So when we're shooting time lapses, we have to bear this in mind. So video is shot between 24, 25 or 29 frames a second. And if you go research on that or listen to Jacques, uh, Jacques Crawford, he is amazing with his video stuff. He'll explain to you better on this, but effectively each frame rate will give you a different cinematic feel. So that changes the way people or you will perceive the way you are seeing a time lapse. So we've got to bear that in mind. The other thing I use is a polarizer, a circular pro polarizer. And these work really, really well for um, bringing out colors. So let's look at that. There's on the right of that picture, you can see with a uh, circular polarizer and on the left is without. And what it does is it darkens and it richens up the greens and the blues. It creates this beautiful contrast. And added benefit is that it stops light down. You can see it's a little darker. And even when we go across to the light here, you can see how it impacts the light. So it's a circular polarizer. It's actually able to twist to get to the point where it goes. I don't know if you've ever used polarized sunglasses. If you tilt your head to the side, the light changes as to this. The other thing that this does is it allows us to see through water. It cuts glare. So it helps a lot with glare and being able to see through those, those different objects and create a different feel, especially if you have a very still lake um, in front of you. Not a lot of those running around South Africa at the moment and not 
much ability to get out and do that. So that's the polarizing filter. Now we're going to talk about planning a shot. Now, in, if you've watched any of my other stuff, one of the biggest things and the most important things for me is making a photograph. So by the same token, we're making a, a, a video. We're making a time lapse. We have to consider what the viewer will see and what emotion you wish, wish to put across. So consider where you're going to shoot. And planning your shot, we have to think of location. Sunrise, sunset, golden hours, uh, when we're going into darkness, our safety, okay, I'm a nature guide, and being out in the Kruger National Park or in a private reserve, that's just going to be a massive problem if you are standing out in the middle of nowhere and lions come eat you. So you have to consider your location, your safety, and what we're doing. So this was in Leidenberg, and it was a misty morning, and I planned to get up early before the sun rose so that we could get the mist coming through. And you can see this mist rolling through the valleys and growing as time goes on. So it's a really nice way of showing the cold and all of that. So I had scouted this place the day before. So I had actually gone out. I chose a spot that I was going to do this all from. I saw that morning that there was going to be mist and that it was misting up like that. So I planned for the following morning. This was my spot. That was the view. Let's go out. So when I got up, I went straight to the point. Cool. So that, that's that. The other thing we can use, and this is a cool app called PhotoPills. It is a free app on the, on the um, Play Store or on the... Uh, on Apple and you can get it here you can see the different where the Sun is going to rise where the Sun's going to set where the moon's going to rise where the moon's going to set within it it has these this was I put the tent up for my son you can see where the Sun is it'll tell you where it's going to be at different times with a virtual point of your camera so it is a powerful tool to be able to plan out these shots to understand if I'm setting up a shot here and I want to get a sunset and the sun's going to move across like this, where am I going to go? Where is it going to end? Okay, it's going to end at that point over there. So what I'm going to do is I want to make sure I incorporate that into my composition. It helps us with our long-term composition. And we have to think so far ahead because you're photographing for a half an hour, two hours, four hours, depends how long your thing is. So we have to understand that by what time is it going to happen. As it comes down here, you can see the sunset part, which is red, and then it goes into twilight after that. So it even tells you where the light, what time the light is going to change and at what point it's going to change. So it gives us this great opportunity to see what's happening. Some other times, we're just in good places to do things. So this was Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda, and... These volcanoes are absolutely beautiful. This specific one is called Sabino, which means a tooth. And the clouds were rolling through, and I couldn't help but shoot a, shoot a time lapse as we were going along. So sometimes it happens, but we have to consider the the what the conditions are. A blue sky, a blue blue sky with no clouds is not going to give us the most effective translation into a time lapse. So we have to consider that. Next thing we have to consider is shutter speed. So like I was saying earlier, video is shot at either 24, 25 or 29 frames a second. Each one giving a very different cinematic feel to what is going on in your system or, or what the viewer is going to perceive it as. And in order to get an effective shutter speed, if I was doing video, I'm always wanting double the shutter uh, the frame rate sometimes now we're shooting a bit faster like 100 frames a second um, I, I know my cameras can shoot the a7s can shoot at 100 frames a second and the reason why we then shoot at 200th of a second but the reason why we do that is for the ability to slow things down afterwards so the faster your frame rate the more we can slow things down and obviously the opposite and what we're doing here the slower your frame rate the faster we can move things through. So 
our shutter speed should be twice this. So 1 50th or 1 60th of a second is ideal. But if you really want to create this really silky smooth appearance, you can go much slower all the way down to one second or three seconds. And that is when this guy comes into his own, the ND filter. Having one of these will then allow you to be able to slow your shutter speeds to these incredible slow points, which will then give us the smooth transitions going through photos. Right, um, so how long? How long do we shoot for? How long will your final video be? This is the most important question. Not how long we're gonna shoot for, how long do you want the video to be? If you are willing to sit through a time lapse that is five minutes long, I don't, it would really have to be something quite spectacular like a volcano erupting in order for me to sit there for five minutes and watch it. Generally, 30 seconds is long and one minute is really long. But as a rule of thumb, if you want a 30 second video, you will need about 750 photos to get that. If you want a one minute, 1,500, and three minutes, 4,500. So you can work the maths out. But we're gonna talk about photo pulls right now because again, um, uh, I will get into it just now when we talk about intervals. But we've got to consider that length of time. Most of my time lapses will be planned for about 15 to 20 seconds, which is more than enough. And then I'll use them as skits within other videos. And it's a nice transition point within videos. Or it's a great thing for social media. Or just to show and explain something that the naked eye can't see. Especially when you look at stars and the galaxy moving across and us spinning in the galaxy really trips people's brains out because they're not used to seeing these um, amazing things. So let's talk about S and Q. S and Q settings back again to the top button here and you will see S and Q right by my finger there. S and Q. And S and Q will allow us to do time lapses inside. So this was a, a time lapse that I did in Madagascar of the forest breathing. I love watching the mists come off the forest like this. And I did this all in camera. I didn't have the time to process. I didn't have the card space to go and shoot 900 photos. So I let the camera do its thing one frame a second and built it into this. And you can see it's a beautiful time lapse that really gets some, some, you get the real feel of a forest breathing there. So how do S and Q settings work? If we go into the first movie setting, if we go to exposure mode, we can choose either S and Q and program or aperture priority, which obviously would be our choice because we want a depth of field, or we can do shutter priority if things are moving and you want to define the movement speed, or we can go into manual and take full control of the camera, set up those settings, and then let the S and Q run. So once we've chosen that, we'll go down to the S and Q settings. If we look at the record setting, you'll see 25p is 25 times quick motion. It is at 50 megabits per second. And if I go to 50p, it will move it up to 50 times speed it up. So there's our one frame a second all the way through to 100 frames a second. For time lapse, we obviously want slower frame rates, so we bring that all the way down to one frame a second. But a nice additional thing is if you do want to go and shoot a um, slow motion, we could then put that up to 50 frames or 100 frames a second and record that in slow motion. The next thing we do is when we're choosing to shoot an S and Q, you want to go into picture modes because you have, you're now going to be limited by what your your editing is going to be afterwards. So you have to get all the systems right. So there's a whole bunch of color modes you can choose from there. Um, and then within that, there's saturation, there's black points, there's all sorts of different things we can tweak within the picture um, profile in order to get our colors just right for that setting. So that's a great way to move through. Now, just a reminder, guys, that we have a promotion running and this promotion will um, 
gives you a 10% cash back if you use the code Richard05 and you will be able to go to cashbacks.co.za and redeem 10% back off of your next Sony Alpha purchase. There are terms and conditions and a few things at the bottom there that you can see um, that will not be included, uh, but for the most part, there's some amazing deals to be had, so get stuck in there. I'm gonna give it a minute just for everyone to get a cup of tea or if needs to do anything else, and I'll be back in about one minute, guys. Alrighty, so now let's get into the guts of this whole thing. This is going to be a very, uh, we're going to get a little technical now and try and understand a few of the reasons why shooting individual photos will change the way your, um, your video looks, your time lapse looks. So let's run through this as we're going along. So when we're shooting individual photos, we have that ability to frame as we need to, to create a very different feel to the image because I can edit it more, but it takes up huge amounts of space. So how do we do this? We have to use the intervalometer. So I showed you the other one, but if we go to menu four, 14 in menu one, you will see that there's an interval shooting timer and we switch that on. We can then choose when we're going to start. So I can choose to start in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, up to an hour from now and what my interval is. And we will talk about interval and what good intervals are for different types of time lapses as they move along. I then can choose how long, how many shots I use. And you can see the shooting time below. It actually adjusts that according to what my shooting interval is and my number of shots is. So this gives us a good idea of when to come back so we can leave the camera out and do our thing. And then we have an auto exposure tracking sensitivity. So if it is starting to change your, if your conditions are changing quite rapidly, so if you have clouds flying overhead, we might wanna keep that low because it must stay at one exposure level the whole time. Otherwise, if we are changing from day to night, we might want it to change regularly as we go along. So it will be able to move through that auto exposure as we need it to. Within photo pills, you can see there's a time lapse function down there, and this will give us some epic information as to working things out. I can choose how long I want my clip length to be. So I could say I want it to be a minute and a half, and it will tell me what my shooting interval should be and how many numbers of photos I need and the total memory used. I can choose the event duration. So if I know that I, the thing's gonna last two hours for the sun to set, then I'm gonna set that up. I can change my frame rate of what my final video is gonna be and it gives us all that information. And finally, I can change the size of my images. So something like the A7R 3 will have a 42 megabyte file, raw file. The A9s will have about a 24 megabyte thing. So you can see just that one would have used 64 megs, uh, gigs of space. So you have to have the right card size. You have to be ready for the card size to understand what you're going to choose. 
You can then also change what your variability is. You want to set what your clip length is or find out what your clip length is. That's how we do it. So it's a great app to figure out the ins and outs of these of working out your time lapses. The next thing is once we've figured out the card. So a card is a very important thing. Here we have uh, the tough cards. I love these guys are absolutely amazing because they are really tough, as they say. This is a 64 gig card and it gives me enough time to be able to do a lot of things. But like we were showing there, if we were taking those photos and we hit 64 gigs or go above it, we need a longer card or we need to change our picture format. How we would do that is we would either change between RAW and JPEG. RAW is a bigger file, so let's understand what RAW and JPEG are because this will be a big part of what is going to make your decision. A JPEG is an 8-bit file, which basically means all computer stuff is a 0 and a 1. Zero and a one. So there are two pieces of the puzzle and there are eight parts of it. So it's an eight bit file. So it's two to the power of eight. So what that means is we have a color gamut from the darkest black to the lightest white of 256 shades of gray between them. We, if we go to a raw 12 bit or a compressed raw, what that's going to give us is 4096 shades from the darkest black to the lightest white which means now when we're starting to edit and push and pull things we're not destroying anything we're not moving anything apart we have lots of options to shade and create the thing i've often i've edited jpeg images before where you try to pull something back let's say we're trying to saturate the blues a bit and you will actually see the color bands because it doesn't have enough information to smoothly transition through it when we go to the uncompressed rules, there's not a huge difference in this. I mean, there's a huge difference of numbers, but in the greater scheme of things, we are looking at 16,000 from black to, to white. And this light is now deciding that it's too hot. So let me just move that out there while it does its job. Otherwise, we're going to burn that thing to death. So I've got no more purple behind me. But... 16,000 gamuts. But what it's also doing is it's lessening the noise. The higher your bitrate, the more space it has to fix noise in the image. So that's a, that's a good reason to choose RAW. The other reason is we have more ability to edit and get what we need out of that image. So if we're running short on space, the JPEG is going to be a smaller file. So that would mean we can plug those in, put them on, especially if you're on a long trip and you can't edit or you don't have space to put things, you could shoot it in JPEG. Otherwise, RAW is always the best way forward. The next thing is aperture. And aperture, quite simply put, is the hole through which light comes in through the front of the camera. Now, the larger the aperture, the more light comes in. The smaller the aperture, the less light that comes in. The biggest part that you need to remember about aperture is that the numbers are f2.8 through f22. But if you work on the numbers, the bigger the number, the more is in focus. That is the biggest effect that aperture is going to have on the photo. And because we're doing landscape stuff, you're generally wanting to shoot from about... 7.18 f8 f7.1 upwards to make sure we have enough in focus from front to back and then this will give us some beautiful contrast from front to back uh, beautiful detail from front to back through the image when we're focusing in any landscape situation you're always trying to focus about a third of the way into the photograph the reason is is focus works uh, what's the word? Uh, focus doesn't work equally forward and backwards. So if I'm focusing at this point, it will move two thirds back and one third forward. So if we focus a third of the way into the photograph, what we're getting then is we're getting to get the back two thirds and the front third in. 
if I did halfway, part of the front of the image would be out of focus. So we're always looking to focus about a third of the way in, and then we'll get our two thirds backwards and one third forward to get the full depth. ISO is gonna play a huge role in a time lapse. And the reason is, is because we're editing. In any landscape situation, you're always looking to have the most dynamic range that you can. People um, think of ISO as a noise thing. It definitely has an impact on noise. Whether the impact is great enough to warrant any thought is a, big, is a great debate that I've had many times. The biggest thing that ISO does is lessen dynamic range. The higher your ISO, the less your dynamic range. So generally we're wanting within an ISO, if I hit my function button, I can click on ISO and then choose my ISO. Because I was in a video setting um, and the specific color bit, I couldn't go lower, but you, you would generally shoot it between 100 and 500 ISO. The lower, the better. The reasoning being that I can edit it more. So I'm going to show you here. This is an edit we're going to go through later, but look at what I did to the blacks. These darks are completely gone. I just pulled the shadows back. That is dynamic range. Dynamic range is our ability to, to still keep your detail in different areas, even if they look dark or blown out. What we have to look at in the top right of that image, up where I am now, is the histogram. We have to pay attention to that histogram. If we mess up on the histogram or we clip them either side, which means that it's too dark, that means that there's no detail left in it. I'm going to go back there because in this video, if you look at the, the spots, as soon as I go up to the little arrow at the top there, you will see there's not a lot of blue showing now, but once I edit it a little bit further, you will see I'm going to drop the blacks and as I go up there again, you'll see the blue. The blue means that I have clipped those areas. There's no detail in it for running any, um, to, for getting any detail back. So if we do that in camera and we go too far, there's no way to recover those things. So we're always looking at our histogram, making sure that we're within the histogram's limits so that we can pull those areas back and get the best edit that we can out of it. Right, so then we're going to choose our shutter interval. Shutter interval is going to determine, or our situation is going to determine the shutter interval. So when we're considering shutter interval, a storm will be about two to three second intervals in between. The reason is, is it's moving quite fast, especially at night here, I've got long shutter speeds, so everything's moving, we're just trying to keep it all rolling along. So two to three seconds for a storm, Calm clouds, about three to five seconds, but that depends on how fast the clouds are moving. If the clouds are moving really quickly, what we would do is we would speed up the, um, the interval. If they're moving really slowly, we might slow that down. We can also do clouds from the perspective of a sunset and how the colors change and how they move. So again, about three to five seconds, is a great amount of time to be shooting that with. Sunsets, watching the sun go down, is five to 15 seconds. Again, this depends on where you are in the world. If you are up near the extremities of the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, the sun goes down really slowly. You might need an even longer time. Here in Africa, it feels as though somebody has attached a cement bag to the sun and it drops very quickly. So we can do about five, five seconds is about a good time for that. Stars, we want about a one to two second interval between photographs. Now these photos were taken at 15 seconds. I'm just gonna go back there again. And um, these, these ones were taken at a 15 second interval which allowed us to get some great great definition out of the sky but we get to we get to see the movement as it goes along so one to two seconds with stars 
here's another one over there with some clouds and the stars moving along and notice the slight movement i've done in post-production which allows for these uh, shots to be a little bit more dynamic than just the things that are moving around in the background and then we have the crazy things that you've probably seen in the bbc programs and um, nature programs is plants growing so you'll require about one to two frames per hour for one to two months so <laughs> it's a commitment so i challenge any one of you to get that done i think i'm going to start one over the next couple of weeks and see what we can get um, but I challenge anyone to do it and send it to me I, I'm I'll be fascinated to see how yours comes along and um, it's not the greatest time of the year to be to be doing that all right so now editing the most important part of this whole progress process I use two programs one is LR, um, Lightroom and the other one is LR time lapse so this is LR time lapse and what I will do is I'll find my key, for, uh, find my um, sequence in the in a lot of time lapse. I will then work out keyframes. So here I'm showing you I've got five keyframes, which means I'm going to edit five images within this sequence, and that will allow me to not have to edit 180. I've chosen this one because there's sunbeams in this specific time lapse, and it looks pretty cool, and what we will do is we're going to look at this time lapse and how it comes out so i will choose my keyframes i'll save that and then i'll drag that into lightroom now once i've got it into lightroom it's now going to import so i'm going to import all of these images and i choose the folder where it's going to go etc all the normal stuff and it will start to import those images as we're going along now what it's done is it's added keyframes so these keyframes I will only edit those keyframes so what I can do is I just click the keyframes this will then run through and I have my five keyframes and what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit just these ones now because the the sequence is pretty much the same all the way along what we're going to do is we're going to go to the develop module and we are going to work through them so here we go into the develop module and we're going to edit each one of these images now so there's some highlights up at the top that are a little blown out and some of the blacks you can see the darks are quite low so the first thing i'm going to do is recover the light in the correct way we're going to make sure that the light comes through well and how i'm going to do that is by lifting the shadows and dropping the highlights and making sure that the sun's rays really start to pop the red areas show the highlights clipped so we're going to and the blue areas the dark so you can see there how we recover those shadows and I was trying to keep now we're getting a better bell curve now we've got we've missed all those clip bits there which is fantastic and now we need to bring back the highlights a little bit we're going to drop the blacks so that we can create a little bit of contrast I don't mind a bit of detail lost in those areas it's not going to be a problem and now we're going to recover a bit of the highlights so that that goes down you'll see that that white goes back to nothing at the top there right then within this there is a great thing where we will use our texture sliders oh, no, we're going to go to the graduated filter and it automatically a lot time lapse installs these four points two of them for from the top down and two of them from the bottom up so you can see the red areas are where we're going to work you can move those around as you need to and you don't need to add any others onto this so what i'll do is i'll work at the bottom there on that first one i'll move it up so that i can get to the bottom ground and i'm only going to work within the red area so it's this graduated filter which allows me to work in specific areas i put up the clarity there some texture and a little bit of the shadows to pull them out a little bit more so that's a great way of creating the contrast down there and make that all look good we're now going to work on the top so i'm going to 
look at where that's moving and how the red is impacting that around us. I'm going to cool this down a bit to make the sky a little bluer than what it was. And I'm going to add some texture and some clarity and definitely some dehaze. And dehaze is a great way. Watch how those sun's rays start to pop out. It really helps with the, um, the, the workflow of this whole thing. So clar I love the dehaze button for skies. And we can lift the shadows a bit and just create a bit more contrast so we create the punch. Now, you wouldn't be able to do that within a video. I can put the saturation up again to bring the blues out a little bit more. And that will be great. From there, we're going to have to edit across all of these images. So now you can see the final image there. It looks pretty nice. You get the real impact of those rays. And once we move it into a time lapse, you're really going to see them starting to move. So now we've got to sync these across all of the different images. And for this, because they are the same, you have to use that scroll thing up at the top. It's a lot, a lot of time lapse sync keyframes. That means this one will now have taken on the exact same settings as the other one, which really helps us. And because all of these are the same, I'm just going to literally sync them across. We're going to look at a different one where each frame keyframe becomes different and we will have to look at how that how we do that. So we're going to edit through that shortly. I had so much sports trying to put these things together last night. My computer was not loving me and was dying and switching off and doing crazy things. So I'm happy that we got to to get these all out to you guys. While this is running through, I'm just going to check if there are any questions. Um, the Sun app is called Photo Pills. Photo Pills. Um, it's a really, really great app. And it works. There's so many different functions. I just don't have the time to go through it. But it was a great question. Um, please keep them coming. All right. So now we've gone back in and we've now reloaded the five images that we have now worked on and we're doing auto transition. So now because I've worked on five images, what it's going to do is it's going to work out what the difference is and how I change those images and create a slow curve to make it work perfectly. And it is a beautiful thing to do. We then click the visualization button, uh, visual, uh, the visual previews, and this will create a visual preview of what, what our thing looks like. So if I hit the play button down there, we'll actually get a visual playback of what it's going to look like. We can then do a deflicker, which is where light actually changes a little bit between frames. And within this, you can either smooth it out to do or slow it down, but it has this incredible way of working and it works really fast and very accurately um, to be able to do that. We can even do a deflicker multiple times or choose spaces where we do it. Um, but you can go check out LR time lapse. I'm going to put a link to LR time lapse in my social media menu and in my Instagram uh, feed in my bio. So now what we're going to do is we're going to read the data from the files so that now LR time lapse has made changes to it. Now we're going to read that so that all of those changes will then go across all of these. I'm just going to speed it up by taking or filtering out these things, then it can roll through and do what it needs to do faster. And what that's going to do now is it places all the minute changes of um, editing have automatically been done by a lot time lapse. It's an incredible thing. Then we go to uh, our library, we select all and we export. Now we can choose our output path the name of where we're going to go, the resolution we're going to export at, and what type. So we can do JPEG, 8-bit, 16-bit, TIFF. It all just depends on which thing you choose to go from. But then we're going to hit export. And once that goes, that's then going to run through an entire export situation where we then, I've already done it, so we'll go back here. And what it does is it pops up this little render screen, which I'm going to open here. There's my render screen. It says where it's from, where it's going to. Chooses our 
We then choose our codec of what we want. MP4 is an easy file. Size, I like 4K because it gives me space to move things around, like I was saying in Premiere Pro, that we can move things around. We then have frame rates. So I can choose different frame rates. At 24 frames, it's gonna give us seven seconds. If I go to 29, it's gonna drop it to six seconds. And so we can change the whole thing. So I'm gonna choose 24 there. Quality, I always choose high unless the, the video needs more. I will then go to very high and ultra high, but very high, uh, high is fine. I can force a 16 by nine crop on that, or I can just leave it where it is. And when I do and move that around, or I can just leave the forced unclicked, which I'm going to do because I prefer to be able to do that in post in Premiere Pro myself. So I will choose where that goes, how it's gonna go there. Then I can choose my motion blur, how much motion blur I want. If I couldn't slow my shutter speed enough, I could do it post in here and I can sharpen the image. So I'm gonna click render video. It's then gonna run through the process down the bottom here really quickly because I speeded it up. I sped it up and uh, at this point it died a few times. Okay, and then once it's done, it opens up this dialog box with our video. So if we open the video, Am I going to do that? No, I'm going to open Premiere Pro and I'm going to drop it straight into Premiere Pro and then we're going to edit it now. So I have a, a project there called Time Lapse. I'm going to open up Time Lapse. I'm going to go to my editing view and I'm going to drop that into Premiere Pro. And this is where I'm now going to mimic that movement that I was talking about. So I'm going to choose a new sequence. I'm going to choose what I want. So I've chosen a 1080p 24 frames a second. I'm calling it an Ndali time lapse because it is at a place called Ndali in Uganda. And then going to drag that time lapse onto the thing and say, keep existing settings, the ones I chose. Because remember, it was shot in 4K. So now because it's 4K, it's bigger than what the rest of the screen is. I need to change my sizing um, to 50% so that I get the right amount in there. And I can move these around. Now, this is where I generate the movement. Now, there's a lot of tutorials on this, guys. I, I know it's running through fast, but I just want to give you a good idea of how I create this and what my thought process is behind it. What we'll do then is I now want to create a beautiful bit of movement, slow movement besides the clouds, which will give it the camera dynamic feel. So I'm going to zoom in here. I'm going to move it down a little bit so that we have a better feel of that. Little, there's a little crater lake at the bottom there. And you can see my keyframes being formed just to the right of my cursor. There we go. And that's my zoom in. And we're going to drop it still a little bit more there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move those two keyframes to the beginning of the sequence. So now that's the zoom in that's going to affect it. And now I'm going to create a new keyframe of 50 and I'm going to put these back to what their normal values are so that I can get back to that. Now what I've done is I've created a second keyframe for each of these scale and movement and I can move those out. Now, when I do the playback, which I'll do down here, you will see the camera move back so it gets wider and wider and we get this very different view of the whole thing. From there, we'll export it and create our video. So that's a, that's a basic run through of an easy time lapse edit where the light's not changing a whole bunch. You can edit all the images pretty much the same. And I will go and have it and we'll open this up and you can have a look at how it all ended coming out. We're just waiting for that to go. It's just a bit jumpy because of the computer processing power it was taking to do that. All right. Next thing we're going to look at is the Holy Grail. Now, 
Holy Grail, like it sounds, is a crazy thing. It is taking a shot from day to night or night to day. And what you can do is by choosing keyframes and then clicking on Holy Grail Wizard, you'll see that it did the opposite curve and it has now changed my images to allow for those manual changes I made as things were going along. So as it was getting darker, what I was doing was slowing the shutter speed or boosting the ISO to get lighter and lighter. Now I will choose my keyframes like I did in the last one. I will read the metadata from files. It will do our thing and the bottom again behind my face, there will be a cursor there which will allow me to, I'm actually gonna move me quickly. I'll move me to there so you can see. And now we've got our, our thing. So it's rolling through our edits. And what we're going to do now is there's our different types of editing. So if I go to keyframes, we now choose and go to all of these things. Once we've edited all of these files, I think I've put this in the wrong sequence. Sorry, guys. And we'll move through all the way through. And what this does is it creates a video that starts a rolling effect like this. And as it gets darker, we get darker and darker through the video until we get to nighttime. And it's a great way of portraying the different ways we can shoot things. And Holy Grail sequences take time. That one edit took me about eight hours and my brain was fried afterwards. But it makes it so much easier because I don't have to edit each keyframe. And again, I want to just explain that when we're taking the shots, I'm adjusting my cameras out, it's shooting in the same place, and as it gets darker, I will boost the exposure up. So I will either slow the shutter speed or um, boost the ISO to keep that going. If I'm using a um, ND filter, I might take the filter off, or you can get variable ND filters, which will then be able to, you'll be able to change the uh, stoppage of light and allow more light through. And what the computer does is it picks up the different ranges of those things, and we're able to then edit it into one smooth video that the transition from night to dark, even though I had big jumps, isn't a big jump at all because that LR time lapse keeps it rolling through as it needs to. So time lapse photography in general is an incredible, incredibly powerful thing to use, uh, especially for videos and for different parts of things. Please guys, if you have any other questions, let me, let me know. Um, it takes a large amount of time and shoves it into a small little portion. We're always looking for dynamic scenes to be able to create incredible images and, and incredible videos. So what we're trying to do is show movement like clouds, like stars, like storms, that you wouldn't normally be able to see the, the dramatic side of it without speeding it up quite a lot. And um, again, like Cape Town, just being able to show the curtain coming over the, uh, over the top there is an incredible, incredible feeling. We have to make sure that when we are planning our shot, that we choose the right place and time to do it. We use apps like PhotoPills to be able to figure out where we are what time sun, sunrise or sunset's gonna be, what the light's gonna be like, where it's gonna rise, where it's gonna set, what our photo's gonna be like, and think about composition. We also wanna shoot wider than what we would normally because what this will allow us to do is create this movement that I've created here. And look out for special situations which will give you a little bit more sense of that movement and special places. Clouds are a great way to figure it out. S and Q settings are amazing at being able to show us and do it all in camera without us having to 
do any editing. So if you're a little daunted by the LR time lapse idea, you can go straight into S and Q settings, set it up for one frame per second, point it in the direction and go. Just remember when you're setting up your camera to make sure that once you have focus to click it to manual focus, make sure that that little button goes across to manual focus over here, manual focus. The reason is otherwise you, your camera will keep trying to refocus each time. And if it starts missing the focus point, you will miss it. So by doing S and Q settings, we can choose our speed of what we want it to be. And that will allow us to move things through. Otherwise we can shoot individual photos using the intervalometer built into our camera, which will give us the ability to lengthen the time longer than one second. And as I, we're going to run through again now, but each situation will have a different um, interval that you would want to choose. We have to, we can use photo pills again to figure out here the time lapse to see what, um, what settings we need to put in and what our intervals are going to be like or how long our video is going to be. We have to choose between whether we're shooting RAW or JPEG based on one, the number of photos we're going to take, uh, our card size and our and our amount of editing we're going to do. One thing on the cards, just to remember that there is a write speed, a read and a write speed. These cards write at 300 megs a second. Make sure that your camera writes at at least 95 megabits per second. I mean, your card writes at 95 megabits per second. Otherwise, you are going to run out of things. Aperture, we want to keep the camera at about 7.1, f7.1 or more to be able to get enough in focus from front to back. And we're always focusing about a third of the way in. ISO, we want to keep as low as possible. 100 is best, but that affects our dynamic range and our ability to pull out detail out of dark areas. Our shutter interval is determined by what we are photographing. A storm, we want about two to three seconds between interval between photographs. Calm clouds, about three to five seconds. If they're very fast moving, we can speed that up. If they're very slow moving, we can slow that down. Um, all the way through to sun uh, sunsets and the sun setting itself between five and 15 um, seconds between shots. Stars, about one to two seconds between each shot and it all depends on what you're shooting and where. This was a cool one with the um, clouds moving across it. And if you want to get really crazy, you can do plants growing. You've seen them in some of the BBC or some of the documentaries where they have one to two frames per hour for one to two months. It's a bit of a labor of love, but it'd be pretty cool to do. And then editing, I use Lightroom and LR time lapse. A lot time lapse is an incredible program that the creators has made to work seamlessly with Lightroom to be able to get some complex edits done without you having to edit too much. By creating keyframes, we can work on five to 10 images, editing each one of those images, and it will then apply the variable or slowly changed settings from the first to the second image gradually so that you don't have these big jumps allowing us to do crazy things and then last but not least the craziest of them all is the holy grail going from a night to day or a day to night which requires incredible amounts of patience and watching your camera and changing of settings but using a lot time lapse we're able to measure those out and create these incredible views as we're going along. So guys, I'm going to check if there's any more questions. It doesn't look like there are. And I really hope that you've enjoyed today. Oh, wait, there's good stuff here. Um, Lars says, great walk through time lapse. Uh, we'll need to rewatch this again. A lot of detail. Thanks, Lars. Thanks very much, Lars. I hope you guys are enjoying your trip and uh, are eventually going to get moving shortly. Lars is doing a trip through Africa and uh, has been stuck in 
the Eastern Cape for a little bit of time. Do you keep an eye on the histogram for best exposure for day going to night when adjusting the aperture? Absolutely, Lars. The biggest thing we've got to remember is that this aperture or, or the, the change in this light, what you will do is you'll try to keep your aperture stuck at one point for as long as possible and use your ISO to bump it up. And then you will bring your aperture down. But the fortunate thing is we can, in our screens, see our histogram. So we are able to see how it goes. So you'll watch it get darker, 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 and then you'll bump it up. And then darker, 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 and then bump it up. So that's great. Uh, how do you find the disco discount code? I'm going to buy a 6600. I watched Shark Crafts. Did I glance at the wrong time? Fond regards. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'm going to put it up right this second for you. Here it is right here. The promo code is Richard05. Richard05. And you can buy the, you buy the camera, keep your slip, then you take it to cashbacks.co.za and you claim it with your slip and this promo code on that. So I hope that helps in keeping all of those things going. I really look forward to seeing some of your work. Please tag me in it. Um, interact with me on all of these things on the platforms. Uh, my Instagram handle is right somewhere here. I'll find one with it. There will be one with it, I promise. There you go. There's my Instagram handle at the bottom. Follow Sony Alpha SA and myself. Please send me any messages that you might have, any questions that you might have to, their, to those things and tag me any of your time-lapse posts. I'd love to see your work. Otherwise, guys, stay safe. Have a fantastic day and happy shooting. Just remember, this takes time. It takes patience. And I will put up the promo. Uh, the promo code is... Richard05, and I'll put up a link to LR time lapse in my Instagram profile on my bio page. There will be a link there. Have a wonderful day, guys. Thank you very, very much for listening.